Hey guys, Mike the Cop, and we need to have a talk about the Parkland school shooting, the cowardly act of some officers and the courageous acts of others. February 14th, 2018, 17 students, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, tragically lost their lives. This video will also not be about um, long-term solutions to school shootings or active shooter situations. I am going to address that in, a, in an upcoming podcast and in other videos. This one is simply going to focus on the inaction of some officers and the action of others. Before we dive into this, I wanna offer a little bit of a disclaimer to those who would think that I am just simply Monday morning quarterbacking this situation. I am not speaking about the situation from just like this random social media commentator who thinks I've got the world figured out just because I'm on Facebook. Rather, I am addressing this as someone who has thought about the situation and looking at the information as a law enforcement officer, as someone who has been uh, taught and trained about these situations, and as someone who has actually responded to a school where a weapon was in play. Uh, the, the, I'm not gonna talk about that situation in particular because this video isn't about me or my situations. It's going to be about this one. Let's get to it. Shortly after the incident uh, happens, it came to light that school resource officer Scott Peterson had stayed outside uh, of the building and never made an attempt to enter the location where there was a known threat to address that threat or to deal with it. Broward County Sheriff Israel was quoted as saying this, that he was devastated and sick to his stomach and said that the SRO should have went in, addressed the killer, killed the killer. And he's right. I have confirmed that the training in that area of Florida is the same training that I have received when it comes to school shootings or active shooter training, which is that even if you are the only officer who is there, if you know that the threat is active, you enter and you go toward the threat to address it and end it if possible. Much has changed in the police response for these types of situations since Columbine. That was actually one of the sparks that led to really actually thinking about how to properly respond to save the maximum number of lives and to deal with the threats as quickly and efficiently as possible in those situations. So currently this isn't an issue of what kind of training they've received because we know and understand that they have the same information that I have, that you should go in and deal with the threat. Subsequently through uh, what are basically leaks to the media, it is known now that at least three other Broward County deputies were standing outside their vehicles with handguns drawn, uh, pointing from a distance from a, from a far perimeter of the situation in ways that they weren't taking any action whatsoever to actually further mitigate the circumstance of the threat at the time. There are actually uh, forums online where officers talk. There's information out there that there are dispatch screens or radio traffic that will eventually become public uh, when the investigation is through. That will indicate that there may have been some command staff that led those officers to only stay on the perimeter, in which case the question becomes, if that's the case, why would they have done that? Because that's not the correct course of action and that needs to be dealt with. But if you're an officer in that position and you know that the right thing to do is to go and address the threat, even if your commanding officers are giving you contrary information to what you know is the right thing to do when you could be going in and trying to make a difference, should you go ahead and break protocol? I can tell you right now from my perspective, from actual real life experience and from talking to other officers, there is an overwhelming agreement that we would just go in and do what we know that we have to do, what we should do to stop that threat. Is there a whole other conversation about training and procedures and, and when you should do that? Yes, sure. But I'm talking about this specific situation. If you hear gunfire, you know it's happening. You know the lives of innocent, uh, the most innocent and vulnerable among us are at risk. What would you do? I, I know that answer for myself and I speak on behalf of a lot of other officers that I've talked to. You go in. Now, I can't speak to the veracity and claim of of a lot of these things that I'm being uh, told or see in the news or, or hearing from officers who are uh, in that area, but let's assume that that's the case. Those things are not the things that we would wanna see from law enforcement officers. To give this a little bit more context, understand that the area where this shooting happened in Parkland is an area that falls under the purview, uh, the jurisdiction of Broward County Sheriff's Office, and out of the more than 3,000 sworn deputies, only maybe five at any given time are in that area because it is a wealthier community, a safer community, 
in which it's essentially considered things like this don't happen here. And unfortunately, it would also appear that what happens in the case of like the school resource officer is he's got 30 plus years on the job and is assigned with others out there who may not be real uh, go-getters, if we, if we could put it that way. Whereas in, in many other areas in the county, more proactive officers who are more interested in actually being proactive against crime and better reactive to crimes in progress would be found. Two problems that I want to point out. First, we cannot ever have officers working on this job that view their their position as being retired on duty or taking the easy way out to finish your career or not fit for duty physically or mentally. This job requires intestinal fortitude to do it and to do it correctly. And if you don't have that, or if you if you don't view this job as a calling and, and more than a paycheck to do that, then please, for the love of God, turn your badge and your gear in today. I am fully comfortable calling that type of inaction cowardly. And I would be ashamed to have you as my backup. I would be ashamed if you were the responding officer to my family or my community in need. We do not and we should not have officers who are incapable or unwilling to take the action necessary to do the job that they promised to do. As police officers, we need to be the ones who are ready in our community's greatest hour of need. Second, we cannot afford to have any lack of training or a focus on prevention and response to major incidents like this uh, in places that we presume these particular crimes aren't likely to happen. We have to train for the worst, we prepare for the worst, and then we work and we hope for the best. But we should not be putting ourselves in position as law enforcement agencies to be caught unawares just because the odds are likely that we might not have to respond to something like that. Police officers cannot be expected to be like Minority Report and predict future crimes, but we should be expected to maintain a certain level of training and standard of efficiency to be able to be ready when it does. We must use every ounce of intelligence and forethought available to us to prepare for situations just like this. So in our enforcing of the laws and in our response to crimes, we can help uh, preserve the life of the most weak and defenseless among us like these students. We may never know the impact that this inaction had on that situation, but all I know is that thinking about it makes me sick to my stomach, it makes me angry to think about, and it does not represent what law enforcement is about, and it certainly doesn't represent what the majority of law enforcement officers are out there doing. So I am clearly not afraid to call a spade a spade and think that we should. There is no room for cowardice and there is no room for corruption in law enforcement and where it exists. Believe me that good officers, the majority of us, are wanting to call that out and don't want it among us. We're already under a microscope enough as it is. We don't need them to help us out. And that's an important fact to turn this to, is that while there, there are police officers, and we see that, that, that exhibit corruption or, or cowardice, that the vast majority do not. Out of the three or four that we're talking about an issue in this incident, uh, there's still more than 3,000 deputies in that county that we would be proud to walk into any situation with and who do their job with that kind of dignity and honor and character that they ought to. And that's true of the majority of police officers. That doesn't excuse that minority. That doesn't excuse it. But I also want to, to make people aware, especially those that come to a video like this or or to the table uh, like this where they already have an anti-cop agenda and they're just using this as, as that kind of ammunition to further entrench themselves in that perception. Those of us who are honest and objective, uh, we can see the acts of courage as well. And we don't want that to be lost because that's important that's important too. It's important to help those who need to be inspired to do this job correctly, to do it correctly. So we have to tell that story as well. Stories like Sergeant Heinrich of Coral Springs, who while he's, he's off duty on that day, watering a baseball field in shorts and t-shirts at the school when the incident happens, doesn't just sit there and do nothing, but springs into action. Listen to his own words as he begins to describe uh, what he experienced that day. My wife and son go to that school. My wife's a teacher there. Um, she's assistant athletic director. <clears throat> Kids started to run. Kids started to scream. 
Uh, that time I heard a round of probably about another five or six shots. Um, obviously, I um, dropped the hose that I was using to water the infield and ran towards the um, parking lot, which is where the kids were. Um, immediately when I ran into the parking lot, I encountered uh, a young student. Um, I have permission from his mother to give his name. His name, uh, his name is Kyle. Um, I'm not going to give you his last name. Um, but Kyle had a massive gunshot wound to his, I can't remember which leg, ankle, ankle area, lower ankle area, I think. Um, I was able to grab him and take him back to where I was, where I previously was, which is the, the baseball area, which they have a clubhouse, in which there was a, one of our coaches and a parent that was actually in the clubhouse. Um, we have a, a first aid kit in the clubhouse. So I was able to go ahead and, and bandage that, do a compression bandage the best that I could with what we had. Um, and then we handed him off and he immediately, fire department was outside the door. After Sergeant Heinrich helped render aid to Kyle, uh, a SWAT captain had arrived with an extra ballistic vest and firearm that Sergeant Heinrich then put on and went in to address the threat. He did off duty what all of us would do that are good cops in that situation, that most of the cops that showed up that day did, they went in. They went in and sacrificed everything about their lives and family for those that they have promised to serve. And many of you may not know this, but Sergeant Heinrich actually was a school resource officer before and prevented a school shooting in the past when he intercepted a firearm uh, going from one student to another. The one who was receiving it actually had written uh, what what people were calling like a manifesto about wanting to shoot people at the school. And he prevented that school shooting. Now that didn't make the news like this incident did. And many will not because that was an act that was prevented by a courageous officer, prevented by an officer doing his job the way that he's supposed to do it. And that's the reality about good cops is that day in and day out, millions of contacts with law enforcement are happening Officers are preventing and engaging in the response to crimes in ways that are good for their community and will always go unnoticed. And, and this channel isn't about to just um, blow smoke about how awesome cops are. This is about a reality of the world that we live in, where law enforcement is intersecting with culture. And in this case, again, we see cops who exhibit tremendous cowardice, but we also see cops who have their finest moment and who demonstrate to the world, we don't want those who are gonna stand outside on the perimeter. We want those who are willing to go in no matter what the cost. Those are my basic thoughts and a basic overview of that particular aspect of this situation. Love to hear from you in the comments. If you have any follow-up questions that relate to this topic in particular, feel free to drop them below. I will respond as best as I can like the video, please share this. I think it's important to get out there and subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications so that you don't miss future conversations like this.